Welcome to the story behind Clue series. In every episode of this series, we talk about the history of one of the original weapons used in the game Clue. This series may not be appropriate for all ages, and listener discretion is advised. In 1966, the Beatles played their friend Klaus Warman their song Tomorrow Never Knows. While Warman went to work sketching, what would become the cover to the band's next album, which I referenced in the story Behind Imagine by John Lennon. This album contained the songs Taxman, Eleanor Rigby, and Good Day Sunshine, and was almost called After Geography. This suggestion was Ringo Starr's idea of a pun based on the Rolling Stones releasing Aftermath. Get it? After Geography? Aftermath? Luckily, the band went with a very to-the-point title that referenced what the record itself does while being played. But that's neither here, there, or everywhere when it comes to the game and movie Clue. We're here to talk about the weapon used for murder. I'm your host, Emily Prokop, and this is the story behind the revolver. But first, a quick message. Are you a fan of podcasts? Of course you are. Why not take the two pods a day challenge all through the month of August by listening to two new podcasts every day. And if you need suggestions, follow the number two pods a day on Twitter or visit two pods a day dot wordpress dot com. Listen more. Listen indie. A lot of what I love finding out through this podcast are the unknown stories of the inventors of everyday objects. But this particular subject's history is already commonly known by anyone who studied the Industrial Revolution. Samuel Colt of Connecticut was granted a patent for the development of the multi-shot revolving firearm in 1836, also known as the revolver. But here's a bit of history you probably didn't learn about Colt and his invention. It was inspired by the steering wheel of a ship, The use of a clutch to either lock the wheel or allow it to spin gave Colt the idea to apply the technique to a single-shot pistol in order to create a rotating cylinder of bullet chambers. But at the time he had this idea, he didn't have the money to create it, so he went on the road performing a street show under the name Dr. Colt. And what exactly did he use to entertain crowds? Laughing gas. But he was successful. And with the money he saved, he was able to put assembly line techniques from the Industrial Revolution to use in manufacturing his revolvers, which became even more popular by the time the Civil War started. But even without the war, the Colt revolvers were already well known because of his promotion tactic of having famous artist George Catlin incorporate them into paintings. Think of this like product placement you might see today in movies and television. He would also hire famous writers who traveled the world to write about them. As much as I try to research enough to be knowledgeable on whatever subject I'm talking about in the podcast for the week, I have trouble finding information about the actual gun used in the movie. According to the internet movie Firearms Database, no, really, that's a pretty interesting site, the revolver in the movie was a Harrington and Richardson Model 733. But probably the most well-known revolver is the Colt 45, known as the Colt Single Action Army Handgun. But Samuel Colt never even held one in his hands, since it was released to the public 10 years after he died in 1862. The Colt 45 was notably used in the shootout in Tombstone, Arizona at the OK Corral in 1881, which included Wyatt Earp, Doc Holliday, and Billy Clanton. The gun became known as the Peacemaker, or the Equalizer. Its legacy became widespread in not only duels, but also the West itself was settled with the help of the Colt 45. The gun was a favorite among heroes like Theodore Roosevelt's Rough Riders and George S. Patton, outlaws such as Billy the Kid, Jesse James, and Butch Cassidy, and even entertainers like Annie Oakley. With the popularity of early cowboy movies, the gun's popularity also grew. But when the West was less wild and new double-action revolvers and semi-automatic pistols came about, the popularity of the Colt 45 waned. Manufacturing even slowed to a halt during World War II, but with the resurgence of Westerns in the 1950s, the Colt 45 made its way into the eye of the mainstream again. 
John Wayne even sported an ivory-gripped pair as his signature pistols. With the popularity of television westerns like Bonanza and The Lone Ranger, Colt 45 manufacturing picked back up in 1956, two years after the movie Clue was to take place. Had Mr. Body waited two more years to hold the party depicted in the movie, the revolver could have very well been the beloved Colt 45. And one more thing, the malt liquor with the same name wasn't named after the peacemaker, but named in honor of 1963 Baltimore Colts running back Cherry Hill, whose jersey number was 45. What are you afraid of? A fate worse than death? No, just death. Isn't that enough? Professor Plum was given the revolver in the movie Clue. He was being blackmailed by Mr. Body for having an affair with one of his patients. Although he was referred to as Professor Plum, in the movie he was portrayed as a doctor of psychology before his license to practice was revoked. In the 1950s, psychology was different than it is today. The most popular form was called humanistic psychology, which focused on free will being the driving force behind behavior, as opposed to biology and hormones as today's psychologists focus on. The 50s was an era where fear and competition were driving forces for people. My dad even remembers doing nuclear bomb drills back in elementary school by crouching in front of his locker or under his desk. And as he grew older, he realized it wasn't to keep him safe. It was an illogical method to help identify the ashes that would have been left in that location had a bomb gone off. And while the threat of nuclear war loomed over that era, the drive to attain the best cars, gadgets, houses, or other material objects also increased the notion that having the best equaled self-worth. This need to attain greatness and do the best to conform to Western ways was perpetuated by popular culture, as well as psychology. One more interesting thing to note about humanistic psychology in the 1950s was the idea that all individuals are unique and have a natural inclination to fully push themselves to their maximum potential. The only problem with that is there's no measure of individual potential, just the outward appearance of conforming to society, which gave the 50s its saccharine stereotype we associated with today. You don't know what kind of people they have in the UN. I might go up in their estimation. The Clue series butler you heard at the beginning of the episode was played by Paul from Rick and Paul Heal the World. Professor Plum imitations provided by Amy from Ladies Love Paul Rudd. If you'd like to add your voice to the podcast, join the Story Behind discussion group on Facebook to be notified when I'm looking for guest voices for the show. Information for this episode was sourced from Rolling Stone, History.com, Psychology Today, and more links which can be found in the show notes at the storybehindpodcast.com. This episode was brought to you by the Story Behind executive producers who support the show through the Patreon page at patreon.com slash the story behind. Thanks for listening.